We're just going to get started. My name is Gihan Fernando. Um, I am the Assistant Vice Provost for the AU Career Center. And I am so happy to have a chance here to talk with my colleagues about the collaboration that exists across the university to help administer appropriately student employment. So let's start quickly with um, a little sense from our audience as to like, why did you choose to come to this session? What are the reasons that you thought might be useful for you to be here? Ashley, help us. Student employment is a big factor when it comes to retention and success. Yes, and in fact, that was the reason that we proposed this session, right? Was that it is really tied both because students need to make money. We know that that's an important part of their, uh, you know, ability to stay and to, uh, succeed, but also I think there, there's a lot of research about the connection that happens when a student gets to know a staff or faculty member pretty well. And if you're working with them, likelihood is good that you're going to have a stronger uh, connection and tie with somebody who could potentially be a mentor. And um, what else? Other thoughts? Yes. Uh, David, I just transitioned to a job where I'm supervising student workers, so yes. front desk workers. So I manage them and I want to help them kind of like build the skills to be marketable once they leave campus. Wonderful. Um, so yes, that's fantastic. And you know, so many of you are probably in offices or in departments that um, will be working with students either directly or indirectly. And so how to do that well, how to both for yourself as a manager, but also for their own development. And we're gonna have on our panel today, um, Rebecca Smith, who is from the library, which is a big hire of students, who's going to be sort of our little bit of a case study in how this all works, right? And an example of how to uh, do, do some of those uh, onboarding and other functions well and effectively. Anything else? And anybody in the chat, feel free to pop things into the chat if you have thoughts or questions on that as well. well yes, uh, Christine. The school communication offices have a lot of student workers. We've had fewer. So uh, we're looking at different ways to expand the opportunities. We talk about development and also creating maybe a stair step mm -hmm. for the students that might start with us in the first year and work their way you know, into not just a semi-managerial role. We often hire right. students that used to work. Um, I love that, sort of like this idea of like a professional ladder almost, or like a development both for them and then it benefits the school because you're- Oh, you're you a know. student worker and we, you just do- Exactly. It's more of a exactly. Uh, so certainly from the career center's point of view and the other career offices on campus, we view the career function um, and students working on campus as being one of the best ways in which they can grow and develop their skills, in addition to doing internships or other experiential things, right? Like this is not just about like that they're accomplishing work for you, right? It's also their own growth and development, both by doing things well, as well as by failing, you know, um, and learning uh, through their mistakes in that process. Well, and I also think we are hearing more about student mental health. Mm -hmm. so it's Absolutely. An opportunity for us to be more in touch with our students, particularly I work in the Dean's office. So um, <clears throat> it's nice to hear from students or to be aware when they're having issues and how can we help support them. Right. Yeah. And for our online audience, in case you didn't hear that comment, it was also about the um, mental health of our students and how we can closer observe and see them and perhaps help um, them and provide resources and support um, as needed as you're getting to know them better uh, with a connection there. All right. Given that we only have 50 minutes, this is one of the shorter sessions, so we're going to try to keep it tight. Um, we have with, I have with me three of my wonderful colleagues who work very closely in this area. And uh, so Julie Jones is with me, who is from the Career Center, is our Director of Employer Relations, and has worked a lot in this area of like helping to manage and supervise students um, and student workers. Um, next to her is uh, Eroika uh, Nguyen and um, Eroika is in our Office of Financial Aid, and especially around issues of federal work study, Eroika 
and her colleagues are going to be an important part of this process for students, right? And so we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, federal work study and those systems work. Um, my colleague Jennifer Scott from HR was going to be on this panel and unfortunately had a family emergency, like literally like in the room as she came in. And so is not going to be able to join us. I will try to cover a little bit of the things that she was going to talk about um, so that you're aware. But as you all know, all student employees um, are AU employees, right? And so HR systems on how to hire um, and track them and make sure they're getting paid and doing their forms correctly and so on and so forth are an important part of this process as well. And then finally, we'll hear from Rebecca Smith, um, who is, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, with the library and is a great exemplar of a good hirer and best practices to use. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ro Nguyen to start us off, if that's okay, uh, to talk about federal work study. And we thought we conceptualized this as being like, that we're going to try to kind of walk through the process that a student, so they would first, they might get a federal work study award, right? And so they like to understand how that process works. And then we'll talk about the career piece and Julie will talk next and then we'll talk about the HR piece and then we'll conclude with um, with um, the example example that uh, Rebecca will provide of, of actually onboarding and hiring yes hi everyone. Okay, um, as Gideon Jihan said, my name is Aroka Nguyen, and I work in the financial aid office um, with the fi Federal Work Study Program. Um, I've been doing this for four years come September at American, and then I'd worked at Marymount University prior to this for many years. Um, so I want to talk and cover a lot of the big concepts related to just the Federal Work Study um, and student workers. Um, should I click this slide? Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is to tell you a little bit about, well, who's eligible for federal work study? Because you always hear there's the federal work study program and then the on-campus employment, which is paid through American. Work study students have to complete a FAFSA for the current school year. So the current school year's FAFSA is the 24-25 FAFSA. And once we receive that for the student, we can tell from that if they have financial need. Um, and so students who cannot file a FAFSA, like a student who's an international student um, or somebody that doesn't have a social security number, they can't get, unfortunately, federal work study because it is offered from the federal government. Um, the other issue is they need to be living in the DC metro area. Um, there's no more teleworking from California for the federal work studies program um, since we've been back with COVID. Um, undergraduates really need to be full time um, to receive it. Graduate students who receive it need to be at least half time enrolled. And the amount, um, I think it's on. I don't know if I put it on the next slide, but I'll tell you the amount undergraduates for the school year can receive $3,000 for the year. It's split in half, 1,500 in the fall, 1,500 in the spring. Graduate students receive $5,000 for the year, split in half again. Um, what we are doing for the new year is we have, we're gonna automatically, this is new this year, increase their work study if they've reached their limit. So for any of you who are supervisors, um, this is new. We didn't do this in the past. In the past, you had to reach out to us proactively if you wanted them to continue once they reached their limit. Now we're going to just look at when they hit or getting close, not when they're at it, but like maybe they have 25% more left. We'll see if we have room to give them more. Um, tied to that, which is new, um, when they set up Workday, they payroll set up Workday in accounting to when they hit their limit to automatically come 
out of the department's budget when they've reached their federal work study limit. And that's why we are looking at it before they get there, because we want to not have that happen. But you could have some students who, because of everything else they have in their award, or because how little need they had to get it in the first place, might not have room to get more. And so then it would be pushed onto the department once they've hit that limit. Um, okay. Um, benefits. We've talked a little bit at the intro about the benefits of work study. Um, the big one is the retention. Um, and like we said, it keeps students here because they've made a connection. And connection, that is an important one because we have resources to help them, not just in our own office, but when they are not succeeding somewhere else, we could get them in touch with the right person in another office where especially the younger students who are their first or second year might not know how to do that on their own. And that might be the deal breaker of why they don't come back. Um, it also helps them versus an off-campus job because of how friendly we are to them. Um, the work-life balance, um, it's very hard to get a job at a restaurant or Starbucks because you have an exam that you didn't realize you didn't study enough for and you need more time the week before. Your boss needs you there as a body. We're here, we can manage that um, and we understand it. So that really helps the student too. Um, and then, like we mentioned, the money, it helps them financially. For the school, every year it helps us because we're saving 75% of this money, the government is paying the bill. We only have to pay 25%. So whenever you're thinking of hiring a student, it really helps AU if you lean towards the work study student financially, just in the financial aspect, it helps us that way. Um, and especially in any year that could be a budget issue year, that's another thing to keep in the back of your head when you're deciding on students. If you have two equal students and one has work study and the other doesn't, this year of all years, this would be a great year to pick the work study student for the budget. Um, and then it helps us because again, we retain students, which is what we wanna do. The next slide, okay. With Workday, um, just last week, HR held a HR training to how to hire students in Workday. And you could reach out to them if you missed it. They have a recording of it. Um, and that was very helpful um, leading into the fall semester. They went over the steps, how to hire them. They um, also talked about uh, the cost centers a little bit and broke that out in the presentation. Um, what yeah. I want to tell you today is about the reports that you can use in Workday to help you track the student's balance and what they have left in work study. Um, the first report is my organization's federal work study balances. If you type this report name in the search bar at the top of Workday, it will come up and this you click on it and you'll enter the your, well, this report, you don't have to enter your student's ID because you're going to get all the students you've hired in your group. You won't get anybody until you've hired them and they're on your books. So this won't work if you're trying to tell if, if you can hire them. Like, do they have work study? I don't know if they have it. The other one I put on here, Federal Work Study Balance Lookup by ID, is the report you want to use if you want to tell if they have work study awarded to them. And accept it. And we have a quick question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Does this include hiring interns as well? Can you repeat the question? Sure. This, Does this? Oh. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Um, this question that we just had in the chat was: Does this include interns as well? Um, if yes, yes, it does. Um, so you want to use the second report I had on here to tell if they have work study. Mm -hmm. Two minutes, okay. And then the top report is the report, the organization's work study by balance is what you'd use bi-monthly, maybe every payroll to see where they are on how much they have left of, to earn before they reach their maximum. Um, if you have any questions about payroll, that you would direct to payroll. Like if you're thinking something doesn't look right when you run that report, if you need help on the hiring, Part, you would direct them to Yolanda Francis and HR. Um, 
The last thing I want to talk about is American University offers a public work study program, which I help Shirley McDonald run in the financial aid office. These are job opportunities for students to do work study, but out in the community, which in the past, they would have been just volunteering and not getting paid. The government wanted the people who need money too, to be able to volunteer. Some students need money and they couldn't volunteer if they couldn't get a job. They can't volunteer and have a job. This is too much while you're a student. So this is a way students can help in the community um, and do outreach, but be paid at the same time. Um, these jobs are posted on the Handshake website um, and they're labeled so students can find them if they search PSWSP, um, they'll be able to find the positions. Oh, that's Sorry, it. Thank you all. Thank you uh, very much, Ro. And uh, we'll now turn it over to Judy Jones, who's going to talk a little bit about their career advising process for students and how they might find uh, your posting or your job. Great. Hi, everyone. So um, at AU, we are fortunate to have career centers um, in a couple different locations to serve different populations. So we have the AU Career Center, which serves um, the majority of students. We have the COGOD Office of Career Engagement, which serves the business students. And we also have the Office of Career Engagement in Office of Career Development in SIS, um, led by Sarah Jones here in the audience. Um, and all of our career centers offer career advising. So the goal is to um, help the students prepare um, for the job search. We um, offer career advising appointments so students can make appointments to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one with an advisor um, at any stage. It's never too early. They don't even need to know what questions to ask. They can just kind of come as they are and the, the advisors would then prompt the questions. Um, we look at their materials to review um, their resume, their cover letter, any written material, uh, writing samples, other things that they might be um, applying to the job with. And we also provide interview prep. So we uh, might do a mock interview and um, help them with some feedback about um, the different things that they would want to practice. And I might just add, you know, while we think of this as like, oh, they're just working for an office, it's fine especially first year students, but also others can be very nervous about this whole process, mm -hmm. right? Like, how do I go about finding these and so on? Yes. And so, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, right. So we prepare them for what they're going into, which is really an experiential learning environment. Um, whether that is an on-campus position, an on off-campus part-time job, an internship, or other types of experiential learning. Um, and we use Handshake, as Ro mentioned, um, that's our uh, career services management tool. And we have other virtual prep tools that I'll talk about. Um, just to give you a sense of how we do this, um, this is a visual and I have copies here as well of our lineup for the fall. And so you'll see on here under signature series and other titles, things like, um, reviewing and building your resume, um, the search process, how to be successful in an interview, all of the foundational skills that we're trying to build in our students so that they're ready and they're competitive. We want them to go out and really feel confident and competitive when they're searching and interviewing for jobs. Um, so please encourage students. These are um, available to any student at AU or alum, and some of them are in person and some of them are virtual. Um, what I didn't mention also is that we have a YouTube channel and a lot of our virtual events will then end up on the YouTube channel, which is then a self-service archive of all of these things that we present on. So um, really, we do have a virtual career center that sort of is in parallel to our uh, physical space. So one of the things that I want to promote today is our part-time employment job fair, which will be on September 4th from 1 to 3.30, right downstairs in the tavern. Um, this event will include both on-campus um, units, so offices that are hiring 
um, students to work either in federal work study or wages um, and off campus. So a couple of our highlight employers from, from off campus include the Smithsonian um, Air and Space Museum. They hire into a part-time job called the Explainers Program, just is a really cool way for students to get a part-time job at the Smithsonian. Um, and Wegmans, which is just down the street, um, they have an amazing program for college students where there's scholarships involved and they also provide flexible scheduling, which we don't always think about our uh, neighborhood partners hiring students as being flexible, but often they are. They know that students need um, flexibility as well. So we, we kind of try to mentor them in that. Um, and then we also have employer pop-up tables and other recruiting programs where we're bringing employers to campus, um, either physically or through our virtual tools to meet students um, for hiring to part-time jobs, internships, and full-time jobs. Um, so please do promote that part-time fair. Um, the other way that we get the word out about all of this is through communication. So um, in June, we wrote to all of the HR reps across campus. Um, so every unit has an HR rep. And if you don't know who your HR rep is, it's a good thing to find out because they have a lot of information, especially this year with Workday. Um, they're gonna have all of those tips and tricks on how to make this work. Um, I have copies of the HR um, reps memo for everybody, uh, which is very detailed. Um, and then we also wrote to the students in um, July, actually in August. Um, and that is a way for us to get them excited about all of the part-time jobs that are available, how to find the jobs, and then how to apply and get all of the paperwork in because there's a lot of paperwork. Um, and so our student employment stakeholders group, which includes um, Ashley from Campus Life, financial aid, HR, our office, and others, um, we work together on, on this, these communications to make sure we're covering all of our bases. Um, so also have copies of that. And finally, one minute, finally, um, we have a student jobs page, which really serves as the student employment hub. So um, it's really easy to find, american.edu backslash student jobs. And as you can see, um, we have a few different things here that are intersecting um, the student employment stakeholders that are here in the room. So we have on the upper left, on-campus student jobs. Students can click there and go straight to the student jobs on Workday. So this is a really great way when students are saying, I can't find a job, I'm looking for an on-campus job, send them to this page, have them click that top left corner and they're gonna see the lineup of jobs available. Um, we also have links to Handshake, which um, over 100,000 positions posted each year, um, jobs, internships, part-time, all types of positions. Um, we have partners like DC Reads, which is one of our public service work study program um, partners. Um, we have a map where we've um, sort of looked at the neighborhood of Tenleytown and what are the different uh, areas of commerce that students might find employment. And we've mapped that out for them by neighborhood. So students who are new to the area can look at this map and sort of see what is available around there. Um, and then we do outreach to those employers to say hire AU students when they come and apply. Um, and then other um, links on there as well. We have a part-time employment webinar um, that's a little bit further down the page, which we just updated this morning. And so um, we do those live. And then we also have this as evergreen content for students to learn about how to find a job and other resources. So that's my time. And I'm turning it over <laughs> to Ava. <laughs> Ava the Hawk. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, Jennifer Scott uh, had a family emergency and couldn't be here. So I'm going to just try, do my best to sort of lightly cover um, the slides that she had and the important points of information, but I don't, I certainly don't have the level of depth of information that she has. Julie, what Julie said earlier about consulting your HR rep, knowing who your HR rep is and then consulting that person is your best solution, at least as a first step, right? And HR is, is itself very able to help you all with uh, more directly if you have more advanced questions about this. So the hiring process, 
um, this is pretty self-evident, right? You create the job in Workday, you post the job, you then go ahead and recruit for the position, and then you hire, right? This is fairly standard um, and sort of is the timeline by which you would go. Go ahead, advance the slide, thank you. Um, and so a few pointers about when you're creating a student job posting, things to think about, right? Are the items that are listed a little bit here on the screen, um, detailed but brief, right? Like, so you want to find that balance between those two things. You uh, should be listing the salary range because that is going to be an important point for students to know how much you are able and willing to pay. Um, and don't put something that you can't, you know, that you can't afford. Yeah, and we had asked a so we had asked a clarifying question. And if you only have the minimum wage, yes. you can just post the minimum. That's, that's your time. Yes, that's perfectly appropriate. Right, exactly. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Christy. That, uh, Christy's comment for those online was that you don't have to post a range; you can just post an amount if that's specifically what it that's is. Fine. Yeah. Um, qualifications and requirements that you're looking for should be listed. And uh, this is something that we are also encouraging is that so that you think about this not only from the perspective of the needs of the office, but from the needs of the development needs of the student, is that you think about framing outcomes for them. Like what are they going to learn from this? And they could be fairly simple things. Like you might think, well, I'm hiring in the library and they're going to sit at a front desk and check people in or check books out or whatever they do in the library. <laughs> um, and you know, there's not much in the way of learning there. No, there absolutely is. The number one reason that people get laid off from or get fired from their work, especially the new employees is lack of timeliness, right? So like being able to show up on time is like a really important baseline function of any job, sort of responsibility and self-management, those kinds of skills. And so you might think about like for whatever it is that you're you're posting for, what are the skills that the student is going to acquire, um, whether it's communication or teamwork and um, to do a little cross-pollination with the work that my office does. Uh, we have a whole list of transferable skills or what we call career competencies that are well validated as being things that employers are looking for, right? So you can help them while you're helping yourself in your hiring as well. Okay. And another question in the chat. Um, um, can you clarify the current rates for undergrads, grads, and PhD? So I don't think that there is one answer to that, right? The minimum wage right now, I should know this, Christy, do you know? 1750? 1750? Yeah, the minimum wage in DC, which is what we have to abide by, is 1750 an hour. And um, beyond that, it is really what you can afford. There's not like you have to have this amount. Um, for certain graduate students, there will be um, who are members of the union, there will be pre prescribed rates of employment, which I don't have off the top of my head, but HR should be able to help you with that. $2 an hour, I don't know. I haven't seen you. Uh, Christy seen is, is sharing that it's it's like around $22 an hour. But again, I would just check in with your HR rep and or HR itself. So a few other, sorry, um, back up. Um, <laughs> other things to note, very importantly this year for the first time, and many of you are already aware of this. Um, in the past, you could just know a student and hire them. Um, and we were seeing a lot of equity issues around that. In fact, when we would do this kind of uh, presentation or encourage students to start applying around this time of the year, we were seeing that they were appropriately saying we can only see like four or five positions posted. And since we put in this requirement that you have to post uh, for a minimum of five days uh, for any student job that's in a, for an undergraduate, um, then we have started to see like right now, I think there's over 40 or 50 jobs posted, right, in the system, which is great. It allows everybody to have a fair chance at it. There are a couple of exceptions to, to that rule that everything has to be posted, which I won't go into right now, but the, the bottom line rule is that most jobs have to be posted, right? And then you want to try to determine some kind of metric and an equitable metric 
for uh, you know objective reasons by which you're going to evaluate the candidates that you get so that you're being again uh, being a fair and appropriate employer one of the things that i know jennifer wants to em emphasize and one of the things we hear a lot in the career office from students is frustration that they apply into the void and then they don't, they just never hear anything till they get like an automated rejection note kind of at the end of the system, uh, you know, when somebody has actually been hired. I would encourage you to do a couple of things in your posting. If you can name like a POC, like point of contact in the posting that students can follow up with, that is a best practice so that then that I know you may not want to reach, like have a thousand emails coming your way, you know, nagging you and asking you for things. Um, it's also appropriate to say you will be contacted if we want an interview, right? If, if you are, um, so you're giving them at least some sense of like, you know, no news is not necessarily bad news, right? Um, and so that kind of communication is sort of a hiring best practice. And um, it, and, uh, the hiring managers toolkit for has uh, which is a resource that the HR office provides is another good uh, resource for navigating this whole process. A couple of other toolkits uh, that HR has, which I don't honestly know that much about, but it gives you good guidance also, as I understand it, on on these pieces. Oh, very important, right? The I-9 process, this is like super important. So there are government forms that you have to fill, that student employee has to have filled out and has to have verified uh, official documentation. There's like a whole series of things that qualify as, as verified documentation to uh, know that they're employable, that they are, you know, have the appropriate uh, hiring status and, are US citizens or have work authorization of one kind or another, um, et cetera. And the, the most important thing to note is that if they have not filled out and completed the I-9 requirements by the third day after their first day of work, then they we may have to lay them off, right? Because they are then we are then as a university out of a compliance as a as an employer if they haven't filled out those forms. So you should be on top of your student employees also about whether they have completed uh, these forms. And again, if they're having trouble with any of this, uh, you will want to have them contact HR and make sure that they're going forward with this. Some of the issues that come up tend to be that students don't have the originals with them. There is a process that HR has where with a parent or guardian, they can be online, but they have to be online together and share the original document. Um, and uh, that is a nice workaround. And there are a couple of exceptions. Again, if the student has previously worked in the past two years for AU, they may not have to go through that process again. But again, good to check rather than just assuming that they don't have to go through that process again. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to talk about the case study for the AU library. Okay. And miraculously, we're on schedule. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Rebecca Smith. I'm here to talk to you today about hiring and uh, onboarding students at the AU library specifically, maybe. Ah, at my department, which is circulation and course reserves. Okay, so some fast facts, I won't read them all out for you. You can see them there, uh, but I'll just let you know that over these next few slides, I'm just going to share a few best practices from our hiring and onboarding process in circulation. As you can see, we hire and onboard frequently based on these numbers, and hopefully they'll work for you or inspire you to think about how you handle hiring and onboarding. So what works for us in hiring? First, we get a lot of applicants to our jobs. Students are very interested in working at the library, but we're also open a wide range of hours and we're open seven days a week. So we start by filtering by logistical requirements and narrowing down our candidate pool. Even if someone is really well qualified, if they're not able to be available when we need them, then there's no point moving forward with them and we can get back to them faster and help them know to move on and look for something else. 
Second, we make sure to identify key qualifications we meet as a group every time we update our job posting, which we do before each post hiring cycle, and make sure that any key qualifications, um, things that are really specific to the job. So everyone wants student workers who have good people skills or good communication skills, but we also know that in our team, for example, there needs to be a lot of flexibility, you need to be good at staying up on learning new processes, and you need to be good at doing routine tasks without getting bored. So thinking of people who are able to fit those specific qualifications. Next, we make sure to actively seek out a diversity of experience and diversity of backgrounds in our candidates. We try to take each applicant on their own merits and be open to people who don't have experience in our field, but may be able to transfer their skills. Shockingly, very few students, even grad students, come into a university with library experience. Go figure. Um, but we often can find people who have customer service experience, or maybe they have experience managing inventory and stocking shelves, or maybe they just wrote a really good cover letter that speaks to our specific job, and we can tell they're very enthusiastic about working for us. And finally, we try to get multiple perspectives. I know this isn't always possible. I'm fortunate that I work with three colleagues in my exact job, so we have to have multiple perspectives by default. But if you're able to get someone else to go through candidates as well, share their ideas about who is best qualified, it helps us counteract the inherent biases that any of us might have and not recognize and diversify our candidate pool. So this is just a sample position description. Uh, like I said, we update ours every semester. A few things that work best for us, uh, naming the very specific and granular responsibilities of our job. Um, it's long and it involves a lot of things, but that's our job. It has a long list of responsibilities and it involves a lot of different things. So it helps us set really clear expectations from the start about what this job will or won't entail. Uh, people, even students, often think library work is sitting around and reading books all day, um, and it's not. So <laughs> that's very helpful for us in setting the tone. Uh, next, we're upfront about our key requirements, and again, including those logistical things like hours and availability. Again, just making sure expectations are done or very clear and students know what they're getting into and whether this position will work for them. We review the position description with students multiple times. So this is almost exactly what is posted on the web along with some additional information in the posting. We then go over it in depth at the interview when we interview students, giving them a chance to ask any questions or expand on anything. And finally, we have an onboarding one-on-one -on -one meeting with the student and one full-time staff member, and we go through it yet again. So they're very familiar with it by the time they start their first shift. So when we move into onboarding, we have a very hands-on, very high-touch onboarding that takes place over the first three shifts with us for about three to four hours at a time. And there's four sort of key components to that. Intentionality, it's progressive, it's very hands-on, and it's very connectional. So what that looks like is it's planned in advance and down to the minute. We have a great little checklist that all of our staff use to make sure that when a student comes in for that shift or comes off a break or is transitioning between activities, we know exactly where they're going next. It's all road mapped out. Uh, the lessons build on each other. That's what I mean by progressive. We start with very general information about the library, your colleagues, the context in which our team works within the library overall, and then on to very nitty gritty information, what softwares you'll be using, what kinds of services we provide, what's expected of you when you're helping users or working in the stacks. Oops. Love that for me. Um, next, we alternate between theoretical and practical lessons. That's what I mean by hands-on. We have a set of modules that we develop to give kind of the more straightforward information. So we might teach a student about a system and then have them practice with an exercise signing into that system and printing a page from it. If they're learning about something like the Library of Congress call number system, then we have them practice hands-on by building a card or pulling books. So we're just trying to reinforce everything that is learned along the way and building in multiple check-in points. So any Anytime there's confusion or something's not hitting right, we know to follow up and spend some more time with them on that. And by connectional, I mean that we build in right from the start multiple opportunities for students to meet all the people they'll be working with. Again, we work a seven day schedule and we work a hybrid schedule. So it's not always easy for them to know who's going to be where and for full-time staff to get to know the new students. So being very intentional about that, having multiple meetings, um, we have a photo wall, we enjoy that a lot. And also we have a shadowing program. So our returning student workers will work one-on-one -on -one with the new students to show them basic tasks and get them oriented and really help them start feeling plugged in from the get-go. So as you can probably tell from just that very brief description, it's pretty intensive for us. We spend a lot of time, energy, and resources in the hiring and the onboarding process before a student has even really started doing any meaningful work with the unit. Um, we think that it's worth it because 
the bottom line is that investing in student workers pays off. Um, the work that we put in, in hiring and onboarding, we really see it makes a meaningful difference. It sets our student workers up for success from the get-go. And as a result, we see really high retention. About 90% of our students stay with us semester on semester, not counting study abroad or graduation. Um, and our students are eager to work for us. They love to recommend us to other people. About probably 20 to 30% of our students have been referred from our current student workers. So we know that it's working well. Um, we find that our students are really eager to learn. They're eager to work. They want to be a part of things and to contribute. And often with the library, where I think we're considered a public service part of the work yeah. study, they see it as a chance to give back to the community, especially when they've benefited from the library. Um, so I know not every department is that exciting, but <laughs> hopefully you can find a way to inspire student workers. Um, we also believe that our students are capable of great things. We actually have three levels that our students can sort of move up in the ranks from level one to two to three. And so we provide them at each level with new opportunities, new chances for advancement. And we really, you know, are able to put a lot of trust in them and they reward us by contributing a lot of value to what we do. We literally couldn't keep the service point open and provide the services we do at the level we do without our student workers. Um, for students, I know we've mentioned this before, but we like to try and be considered a safe place to learn. We do consider our students real workers. We want to hold them accountable, help them gain those professional skills, be career ready, but in an environment that is supportive. They know that they can make mistakes, they can ask questions, and it's going to be a chance for them to learn and be um, supported in that. Uh, and then finally, I know it's already been touched on, but just to reiterate, student employment is a huge part of the student experience at AU, especially for students who need a job, who need that money. Uh, when we hire and manage our students with intentionality, we can empower them through their work to get connected, find a place to belong, and plug in to AU. So I won't go through this part because I could do a whole presentation just about everything else we do with student management, but I will say that um, in our team, we are in the middle of a lot of ongoing conversations, we're always talking nonstop about how to be the best managers we can and provide students with a great work environment. So if this is something you're interested in, I would love to have you reach out. Let's get connected. Um, my coworkers and I in this direct student management role are really looking to build those connections across campus with other student managers, try to share tips, tricks, um, information that we think might be helpful. So we'd love to build that community with you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much. much. Sure. Um, so um, now we have some time for, um, not a lot of time, but we have some time for questions. Um, and also I'd love to hear comments from you all. Um, if, for example, you have a practice in your office uh, that has worked really well for you, I'd love to share with the community so that we can amplify those and borrow and be better as a, as a whole. I have a question. Yes, Tiana. For the part-time student there, um, so I work in the Office of Enrollment. Um, I have 40 undergraduate students on staff as AU ambassadors, so I oversee the tour guide program here at AU. Um, it is one of the more selective like positions on campus, just with the number of spots that we have available. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask if it's, so like my hiring timeline, tours start the week after this fair is happening. Is it possible for those of us who we've wrapped up the hiring process for the fall, can we still table? Like I have over 130 applications that we got for this fall semester and I have seven spots. So like being able to have um, FaceTime, like the value in the fair I think is great, but I, I wasn't clear on like, can those of us who I know that we're going to open it up again to have FaceTime with students that kind of explain, like, here are the expectations, here's the position. Um, yeah, I can answer that. that. Sure, I think, sure, I think, I think that, I makes, think that sense. makes sense. Um, um, and, and there are, sure. yes, sure. Um, there are currently 16 tables and there's about 22 left. So you still have an opportunity to sign up. Um, and I think that that would be really helpful um, in terms of like the next stage of your hiring process yeah. to be able to make those connections and give some of that information. So I absolutely think that's mm -hmm. appropriate. And then the comment I was going to make, and I have mentioned this in other settings before, but um, I've been supervising students for over 10 years. So I've figured it out kind of as I progressed in my career, but um, it's unfortunate that uh, your colleague from HR isn't here, but I do think that 
um, the university could benefit from um, an actual like onboarding HR training for those of us who supervise students. As Johan mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the students build really close relationships with us. They get comfortable with us, but we are oftentimes put in situations where student is coming to us for something that is not work related. Mm -hmm. And so knowing when you're a confidential resource, when you need to fill out a care report. Mm -hmm. um, when I accepted my job in admissions, it was not to supervise students. And so I don't have a background in counseling. I don't have, uh, you know, the, when I started this job, that was not part of mm -hmm. my onboarding. And I think that there, would be value for the university to incorporate into onboarding for individuals that specifically supervise students for there to be, you know, some sort of training for us that, okay, if a student is coming to you and they've been sexually assaulted, like, what do you need to do if someone is threatening to harm themselves? Like, over the years, like, now I know like, where right. I need to go, but as a young professional, first time supervising students, I think that there's value in that thing for my life. Thank, Thank you, Fikiana. Yeah, the, the comment for those of you online uh, was that it would be really useful, especially for new supervisors, to have a resource from HR, uh, like an onboarding training or a resource a toolkit uh, about ways in which you would handle, particularly the difficult issues around things like where would you deal with a help a student go if they had a sexual assault issue or other such uh, difficult uh, situations with a, with a student that you would need to work with. Um, yes, there's a question in the, um, <laughs> there is a question online. Um, so can you, sorry, is there, is that guidance available for hiring and working with students as research assistants? So I would say that everything we have talked about applies across the board, right? Like all the pieces that we're talking about, it's not really distinguished by the kind of job that they have at AU, but if they're going to be working with it's with a faculty member um, as a research assistant versus being with a, um, you know, one of the offices like ours or any of you in the audience, um, basically the same. I don't know if you all have any additional pieces that you want to highlight. Hi. Yes, I would say I would recommend you reach out to your HR rep. It, it sounds like you're a faculty member, I'm assuming. Um, the HR rep in your academic school, they can help you with your options on how you go about hiring somebody for that type of position. Uh, we'll be working. Uh -huh. um, and so the HR rep, anytime you need help hiring, especially since we've moved to Workday, start with the first point of contact should be your HR rep. Every department has one. So if you don't know who yours is, reach out to your supervisor first. They can direct you to the HR rep. Um, even as much as I do with the work study program, I still heavily rely on my HR rep for the hiring steps a lot in Workday. If there's some point where she needs help, because Workday is still new and some of the steps aren't as smooth yet, then my HR rep and myself reach out to our contacts in HR. Um, and so your HR rep could direct you to the right contact in HR. Um, and so Workday does have, again, ask your HR rep. They just went to a training last week that has a recorded presentation they could share with you too. Um, so I really encourage you to find out who your HR rep is for the purpose of learning Workday. And the second purpose is for hiring, like if you're a faculty and you want to hire a student at a research position, that is very doable, but it depends how your department wants to go about doing it. So you need to reach out to your HR rep and see how your department wants to do it. I'm just, uh, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the um in the chat that are basically endorsing your proposal, Tiana. That, um, and so uh, Julie had responded in the chat that we'll definitely pass this along to, uh, to HR. I would also add that both those of you, this is not something that hasn't been on all of our radars. And in fact, we've been asking for like an, a hiring and onboarding resource for students. They have all this material for, for regular full-time employees of AU. 
uh, which I hope can be relatively simply adapted, that it's not going to be a whole lot of work to do it, but it just hasn't, hasn't happened yet. I think it could be really helpful if those of you who would find this resource valuable would write to them and make this request. If there's a flurry of such requests, I think that that might also help move that along. And I might just write to the top, you know, write to, um, I forget the name of the new person who took over from, um, uh, do, do any of you remember? It was just an Gerald? No. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, head of HR, write to him. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I think we are just over time. So we'll, um, <laughs> yes, I'm getting the hook now from our CTRL, CTRL colleague in the back. Um, we will be happy to wrap up and I'm sure a few of us will at least be able to stay and answer questions if anybody has anything that they would like to talk about individually. Thank you for being here.